this location was. But the Buckeye Institute is a wonderful font of knowledge for you to use and share. And I assume, since we're all engaged uh, activists and citizens, you're already familiar with use. And if you're not, please get familiar because they do research and provide information that we can all use and share and it's concise and it's a wonderful uh, way to get the information and use it in your stories, use it in your blogs, use it on your Facebook. So without further ado, here's Greg. Thank you very, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for having me here today. I'm, I'm very glad to, to, to be here. And actually I was at the uh, tea party event here a few weeks ago. I'm not sure if that was the last meeting or the one prior to that. Uh, okay, uh, so some of you uh, may have heard a portion of what I'm going to go over, and some of the, the, so it might be new to some of you, some of it might be similar, so I'm going to try not to be overly repetitive, but just, just in case, who all was here the last time I was here speaking at the Tea Party event here? Okay, so there's a few of you, and a few of you were also probably, were any of you at the uh, uh, We the People convention in Columbus? All right, so there's there's a, a good chunk of you, which is awesome, actually. That means everybody's uh, highly, highly uh, engaged uh, on these issues, and that's great to see. Um, one of the things I want to do, uh, I think many of you are familiar with the Buckeye Institute. We're a 501c3. We're a, a think tank. Uh, we look and do public policy research on a whole host of issues, uh, tax policy, regulation policy, um, education policy, uh, labor reform, all of these kind of issues. We spoke a lot during the Senate Bill 5 debate about the collective bargaining issues. By the way, those things have not gone away. When we talk about local government, in fact, they're still as big of an issue. Uh, I came in a little late, so I hope I'm not uh, touching too much on maybe some of the stuff you already heard there, but I can't reinforce enough how big a deal collective bargaining really is at the local level. Um, I mean, it's an 800-pound gorilla. So just because Senate Bill 5 failed last year doesn't mean that we still don't have this huge, massive thing that's uh, confronting us at the local level. But what I'd like to do is I'm going to put a little bit of context here, so some of this may be a little familiar to some of you. Uh, but one of the things is uh, I think the next session kind of discusses some of the public records and the requests and the things that you can do to kind of dig in and get information from all kinds of various local governmental entities, from the school boards to your cities, trustees, all of that. That's really important. We certainly use that tool ourselves at the Buckeye Institute. We're probably most famous <laughs> for our salary database uh, that we have on our website uh, constantly. We, we actually need to, uh, we've got the latest data we can get from the state and the teacher data that we got from the Ohio Department of Education. Uh, we're in the process. We have a small staff, so candidly, we're a little bit behind in terms of some of the local governmental bodies that we would like to get. We uh, have tried to focus on ur major urban areas, Cincinnati, uh, obviously Columbus, basically the three C's, Dayton, all those areas, and the counties. We have a sprinkling of a few smaller entities that we try to, to, to get information on as well. But because of the fact that you have to do separate public records requests for every single entity that's out there, uh, given the small staff that we have, we just don't have the ability to do that. Caveat being, if anybody else is doing public records requests and gets payroll information and things of that nature and would like to share spreadsheets and various information that perhaps you've obtained for your own uh, reasons to educate yourself about your uh, spending patterns, at least the salary information especially, we would certainly uh, be open to anybody wanting to communicate with us about that because that kind of leverages our limited resources to be able to make it available on a broader basis and then also be able to make that available to other activists at the local level. But again, I want to put this into context. Local government a lot of times is seen, obviously it's very uh, much seen in what you is impacting you on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, who you know, your local officials, the taxes that you're spending at the local level for all whole host of, of different services, especially safety services, education, and all of that. But there is a broader context and local government and the spending and the tax policy all sort of interrelates and does impact the situation that Ohio at large faces. So uh, want to mention that local government spending is a big deal in Ohio. That goes without saying. That's why everybody's here. Um, this is the context. And again, this might be a little repetitive, and I'll apologize. So I'll kind of maybe go through a little quickly, and then I'll open it up to questions uh, at the end on a whole host of different uh, pieces that I'll talk about. But I always say that Ohio has been, in a certain sense, on a death spiral economically for decades. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Labor is 
the, the pow ongoing power of labor in Ohio is one of the largest reasons why, but we shouldn't kid ourselves, tax policy in the state of Ohio is a big reason why too. State policy, uh, state tax policy and local uh, government tax policy. Uh, again, for context basis, uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, Ohio's population only grew about 1.6% over the decade between 2000 and 2010, 11.3 to 11.5 million. Meanwhile, the U.S. writ large grew quite a bit higher, 10%, 281 to, uh, million to uh, 308, about 309 million. And that's official uh, people that we know. Uh, just. <laughs> Had to throw that in there. Uh, these are, we're, we're going to try to get some updates here. This is again based on the, the census. Uh, these are population changes in individual counties. Uh, the percentage changes, Delaware County, just north of, of, of kind of the Columbus and Franklin County, grew uh, a great deal. Warren County has done very well in terms of population growth. But here on the, on the uh, bottom side, you can see where there's a lot of counties that have not been doing very well. Cuyahoga County, all the way up north lost eight and a half percent of its population. Um, the, the, the issue here is you kind of get a sense that Ohio, there are a few areas that are doing very well, uh, but there's a great swath of the state, especially on the uh, border areas and kind of up in the north area around cities uh, that, that are not doing very well, not maintaining their population and people are le either leaving the, or, or, or either leaving the state uh, or at least migrating to other areas within the state, but many of them are leaving the state. So, uh, you know, Ohio gained uh, the, the, the 3, 8,000 population during about 2011 alone, according to census estimates. This was after the latest 2010 census, so this is the current estimate. Uh, there was about 3 million growth uh, for the U.S. in 2011, so essentially the trend that you saw between 2000 and 2010 is essentially continuing. Ohio, Ohio is gaining population in, a, in an absolute sense, but in a relative sense, Ohio is not keeping pace with the rest of the country. And it's in that relative sense that I think is the most important thing to keep in mind uh, because that's how we compete uh, nationally. Uh, you know, again, you, uh, even in the 1990s, which are sort of the Halicon days, the days of the uh, stock market to doing really well, everybody remembers that. Uh, but what was interesting was population still was lagging. It wasn't keeping up with states in the South and now the West. Uh, Ohio lost one congressional seat after the 2000 census. We've lost two seats after the 2010 census, so we're losing two congressional seats uh, at the end of this election cycle. So, but here's the interesting thing. You really want to know what happened, and you want to look at it in the broad view. And again, I talked about the broad view because this really paints the picture for us. We had 24 congressional seats in the 1960s. We're going to be down to 16 now. That's eight seats in 50 years that Ohio has lost. That's, that's you know, I mean, you know, we don't want to have talk too much about political power and government and all that because, I mean, obviously we want it limited. But when you want influence in Washington, when you want your voice heard, the more seats, obviously, that you have in the House, the better. We have a particularly, I think we're in the very district of, of, of a a particularly powerful congressional member, which has an interesting relationship, I think, with a lot of uh, a lot of folks, both good and bad in some ways. Um, but the key thing is eight seats lost. So Ohio used to be one of these incredible states. I mean, uh, I, I dropped this the slide, but I always say I think we had seven of eleven presidents between the, in the post Civil War era to the 1920s through President Harding who I think was the actual last president that came from Ohio. That was in the 20s, before Hoover, before FDR, before all these massive changes that we've seen with the New Deal era and everything else. That's, a, that's, that's not just a generation ago, that's an epoch ago that we're talking about in terms of Ohio strength and power. So again, Ohio has been sliding. We were at the top, one of the top states at the, uh, of the pyramid, and we simply uh, aren't now. Uh, Ohio's economy has not kept pace. This was the latest number. Actually, yesterday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics just came out with new unemployment uh, data. We're actually working on our latest. So th these charts come from our monthly report of Ohio by the numbers. Um, so the latest one will be coming out next week. We're working on it right now. Uh, but our peak private sector, these are private sector jobs. 
So we actually, when you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we actually pull out government jobs out of the non-farm payroll. I'm getting a little wonky here, but uh, that's what we do. So this is the peak of Ohio's private sector employment in the last 30 plus years, was 4.85 million jobs. This is before the stock market tech bubble bursting in 2000. So as of June, we had about 4.41 million jobs. So we were over 400,000 down uh, from our peak employment. And actually we have gained, uh, the preliminary numbers that came out yesterday, I think we gained about 16,000 approximately private sector jobs uh, uh, in the revised, uh, I'm getting wonky again, but these were the preliminary numbers. The new numbers actually bumped us up a little bit beyond the 4.41 million, so we're a little bit higher, but we're still below 4.5 million, so we're still about 400 to 1,000 below. And what that really uh, means, so this number is slightly out of date as of yesterday, uh, but the key thing here is we have calculated, if you look at the growth rate of Ohio's private sector economy throughout the 1990s, so if you take that average rate of growth, we would take about five years. We're a little under five years now. We've actually seen some pretty decent improvement the last few months. So we're a little under a five-year window, but you would have to have consistent growth of that average rate on a monthly basis for the next close to five years to get back to that 4.8 million private sector peak employment. Point there being, we need to have pro-growth, obviously, policies and things like that to make sure we can keep that up. Otherwise, we're never gonna get back to where we once were. Uh, and actually, if you look at the overall average of growth between 1990 and today, it would actually take longer to, to get back to that peak employment. And if you really want to get kind of a little bit depressed and look at what the overall number is, uh, if you factor in some of the bad times that we've had, of course we've had some bad times over the last 20 years because of the different uh, bubbles bursting and, and relative economic issues, uh, it could take, if you look at the actual overall numbers, including the bad years, you're looking at something like 30 years. <laughs> so we, 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 Ohio is still, uh, we're seeing some rays of sunshine. I think that's a very important thing to note, uh, but we're still a long ways away from getting back to where we should be. Uh, private sectors also, the median incomes have not uh, done particularly well here in Ohio. Again, the Congress of the Census Bureau between 2006 and 2010, you had about 47,358 was our median income versus over 51, close to 52,000 from a national perspective. Ohio's private sector economy also lost jobs in, uh, uh, in practically uh, every single county between 2008 and 2009, which was the Great Recession, the height of the Great Recession that we just are, have, have kind of come through and are still sputtering our way through. Uh, even Delaware County, the, the, the county that had the great population expansion, has gone, uh, had a small decline, less than a percent, uh, but still. And again, you can see the reds, basically the red states are the states with the highest percentage loss. The white, the white counties are the ones that had the least percentage loss. But you can see again, Ohio uh, had a, was hit particularly hard. I mean, everybody in the country was hit hard with the Great Recession, so we shouldn't uh, discount the fact that nobody was coming through that thing unscathed. But the key thing that I always say is, during the best of times, Ohio never did as well as, as uh, other states. Uh, we were ranked uh, like 38th in terms of private sector job growth from 1990 to 2000, the good days. And then we lost more private sector jobs um, between 2000 and 2010 than any other state in the country, save Michigan. We lost 614,000 private sector jobs in that time period. So the narrative of Ohio and this whole decline that I've been talking about is we don't do as well as other states when the times are good, and we do a heck of a lot worse than most other states when times are bad. So if you put those two things together, you see that Ohio just is not doing well. This is another thing looking at the median household income and, and changes in it. There are a few counties that saw an increase in, in income. Those, again, are the lighter colors. The red counties are the, are the ones that saw a drastic uh, some cases over double digit declines in median income. So, uh, we also see that Ohio has, ha has a much different employment sector. These are pulled from the Bureau of Labor Statistics as well. Here is the, um, 
uh, what, what you're seeing is that, that how they break down the different sectors of the economy. And I don't think the colors actually come out all that well on the screen here. I don't think you can differentiate red from yellow particularly. Um, but uh, the red, uh, uh, these are on our website as well, so you can, you can take a look there. Basically what it means is red, those entities that are in red are st uh, the industry sectors that have less jobs uh, today than in either 1990 or 2000. Those that are yellow have more jobs in 1990 but less than in 2000. And only two, uh, which is practically most of them are either red or yellow, the only two ones that actually have more are professional and business services and education and health services. They actually have more jobs in those two particular subsectors than any other uh, 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 than they did in those two other time periods, 1990 and 2000. Big hit was construction went down 180, but no surprise, manufacturing, uh, over 600,000, uh, or, or we went from uh, over 1 million to only 660,000, so you lost about 400,000 jobs in the manufacturing sector. So, as we all know, manufacturing played a major role in Ohio's history, and so even you, you're seeing the shift in the profile of our entire workforce uh, here, too, and that's really the, the nut, uh, the, the net tail of this particular slide. So, what happened in Ohio that made all this ha happen? I've kind of hinted at it. Still sort of in a rust belt mentality in the 21st century. Things have changed, globalization. There's good things about globalization, there's bad things about globalization. Uh, but the point is that Ohio has not done as good a job as other states at, at exploiting some of the changes that have happened economically. <coughs> Simply put, unions, very, very powerful. Not as powerful in the private sector anymore, although they still have more influence, I think, than a lot of people would feel comfortable with. But it's in the public sector that they particularly are a pernicious influence. Um, Senate Bill 5, uh, I mean, just to be candid about it, um, the loss of Senate Bill 5 is, is, is deeply, deeply, deeply problematic for a whole host, not only from a policy standpoint, but quite frankly from a political standpoint too, because it's killed off the desire of a lot of political leaders to make changes in policy that are direly needed in Ohio. Um, that, that was just, I, I can't stress how unfortunate that was. Essentially, though, taxpayers not really uh, being put forefront in the mind of policymakers, and that's really a big issue. High taxes, and the the which is partially driven by some of the union issues and other regulatory issues, uh, have really driven businesses away from wanting to embrace Ohio. The states that have gained those congressional seats, as we're losing eight over 50 years, who's gaining them? Eh, Florida, South Carolina, Arizona, New Mexico. Colorado, Texas. Texas actually is doing pretty well, very well for itself. Um, and quite frankly, Utah has done relatively well. The state that's doing really well now, they, have a really, they had a really small population, but they're booming in terms of percentage. North Dakota is incredible now. Part of that's natural resources, and, and which gets us, you know, obviously Ohio is talking an awful lot about our own potential natural resources, but we should be very clear that, 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 that's, uh, that that's really good for them. Uh, this is where we start now. I, I give you all that to paint the picture of what's happened to Ohio and where we're at and where we were and where we ideally would like to get back to. This is a chart courtesy of the uh, Tax Foundation, a nonpartisan organization that we, we, we work with uh, quite a bit. Uh, and from 1977 to 2009, what it does is it looks at the state and local tax burden and it compares it to the average. So the rank is this. This is really the thing to pay attention to. The, the rank column is this one, sort of the uh, third one over from the left. And in Ohio, rank one is the worst. And so in 1977, our total burden was ranked 40th. So actually, we were not doing all that badly at that time period. We were certainly in the top, the, the upper tier in terms of at least amount of cumulative tax burden. Unfortunately, we had an income tax come in, we had collective bargaining come in, spending going up, a whole bunch of different things, and uh, we, throughout the 80s, found ourselves shifting into the top half rather than the bottom half. So in, term, in other words, our burden was increasing, and at one point, we got all the way to ranking seven in 2005. So that meant that there was only, <laughs> there were only basically six states that had a worse cumulative tax burden than we did. So we went from one of the best to less than 30 years later, one of the worst combined tax rates ever. Now, 
we were seeing our ranking improve some over the last few years. I think, uh, I think actually the I got to get the latest things from the Tax Foundation, but I think we've actually gone a little even improved a little bit more. We're back to 18 now, uh, so we're going in the right direction. And candidly, a good chunk of that has been because of some substantial uh, reforms at the state level with taxes. There was a 21% income tax that's been phased in between 2005 and. Actually, it was postponed for a while in the Strickland years. Governor Kasich let it go forward uh, in the last budget. Uh, there was a substantial business tax reform. There's a cat tax now. They phased out other taxes that were uh, difficult for particularly manufacturing type businesses and things like that, tangible personal property and a variety of other things. Bottom line with that is the state tax burden has actually improved and you're seeing that reflected in those numbers. What has not improved are local taxes which now we're getting closer to getting back. I know I've kind of skirted around all these other issues, but this is where the local issue starts to really plug into this master narrative of what's really going on. Um, cost of government certainly grows. You have employment, decompensation, <clears throat> expenses in primary and secondary education. Candidly, Medicaid is a big expense. Uh, rehabilitation corrections, these are state expenses, but watch that employee compensation. I'm gonna skip this one. <coughs> and and get back here because here is where the rubber really meets the road for all of you most especially state taxes improved but get a load of this according to the Ohio Department of Taxation oh, as a percentage of income Ohio has the sixth worst local tax environment in the nation it's about 5.1 percent so we have a very high local tax burden which to some extent is counteracting the benefits of some of the state policies that are happening. We also have a whopping, and I do mean a whopping, 4,000 approximately different types of taxing entities throughout the state of Ohio. Now, these include townships, they include the, I mean, the villages, townships, counties, cities, uh, school districts, but I mean, you've got library districts, you've got MRDD districts, you've got uh, uh, senior levies and, and taxing authority there. You've got watershed districts, soil conservation districts. I mean, it's it's a, a web of things that's so complicated. It's actually difficult. The reason we have, say, nearly 4,000 is nobody at the state can even tell it. And I, I don't actually, I can't give you the exact number because there are so many. And there's ways of creating new ones for different kinds of projects and in particular watershed kind of stuff sometimes get created uh, periodically here and there by votes of commissioners, county commissioners and things like that. So there's a, an always kind of fluctuating number of these local governmental entities. But we have a low, high local tax burden and a myriad of local tax entities. There, there is sort of a connection here, I think. On average, there are over 41 taxing authorities per county in Ohio. That's 46% more than the national average of about 28. So we have an awful lot of authorities. Again, it's, it, it's all those different kinds of things that pop up that, that uh, create this exorbitant number. Um, Ohio has the sixth highest number of municipalities in the country, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, of about 938 municipalities about 13, a little over 1,300 townships. We all know we have over 600 school districts. And just to put it into context here, Cuyahoga County alone has 104 local governmental entities. Meanwhile, not a surprise, Hawking County, a little bit smaller population, has about 20. Uh, but you can tell, of course, they also have a very small, uh, relatively speaking, population. Interestingly enough, 20 for 29,000 still seems a little, maybe a little high. Uh, even at that level, but, uh, the, and obviously you have all the urban counties have more, but even the, the rural counties, we, we find that there's a ton of different entities there. Interestingly enough, the structure of the local government is a bit of a challenge. Ohio is one of only 10 states that allow local uh, municipal municipalities to uh, levy income taxes, and we have the second highest number of such levies in the country because we have 774 different municipalities that are levying some level of income tax. Uh, Pennsylvania, thank heavens you don't live there, they have 2,000 something entities that are levying income tax. Although, in the defense of our neighbor, they define income uniformly across different local governmental entities. One of the challenges businesses has in Ohio is 
that different in, in, uh, municipalities can sometimes define things slightly differently so that the base of what qualifies uh, for the tax at the income level can be somewhat different and you really have to be extremely familiar to, to know if you happen to have a business that, that has multiple locations, you have to then know how to withhold the exact level by the entity. In fact, this is such a problem that the CPAs, the, the group of the uh, Ohio Association of CPAs and a number of other organizations are, are working to try to create some standard uniformity across the board so that we can have a, a state, and, and there's some controversy because not only they're actually also talking about uh, consolidated uh, municipal income tax collection at the state level and, and then the state would redistribute it based on population, things like that. That hasn't happened yet. That's one of the conversations in Columbus right now. But the standardization issue, when everyone thinks about the state consolidating, taking, and then redistributing, which is, I think, a challenge and, and, and is open for some serious debate, uh, it's hard to argue that we should have multiple definitions of, of what constitutes income taxes. Not real business friendly. Here's another thing that might uh, catch you guys. Uh, of course, I talked specifically to a couple of guys at the Ohio Department of Taxation, and this is on average. Uh, the, so some are gonna be a lot more, and some are gonna be somewhat less, uh, but the average Ohio home has 25 different levies on it. Now, what's fascinating about this is some of these levies are permanent levies that you may not have ever voted on yourself because they were there before you ever moved to your house. The permanent school levy, permanent you know, safety levy, operating levies, various things like that. Uh, so a lot of times when you're voting, especially on the school levies, you're voting on renewals or new levies for the most part. You're not, I mean, because there's things that you're never ever voting on at all. So that's something to always consider when you, when you get there and you get to the voting booth. Uh, the, the next, uh, I don't need to do that. This is a great chart. We're actually working on a new one uh, that's gonna, but this is Ohio school districts. These are the cumulative, based on the five-year projections that each individual school district has to submit to the Ohio Department of Education. Uh, they submit them in May and they submit them in October of each year. Uh, we looked at what is their deficit for every district and then we looked at the cumulative deficits for all the districts in each individual county to come up with essentially the deficit per county and the statewide deficit five years out from that, from 2010. This was October of 2010. We did this before the last statewide election because we wanted to be clear there's a problem in Ohio spending in the schools and that the spending issue is more prevalent than the lack of revenue argument that everybody always wants to make, especially the local school boards and teachers unions and everything else. So uh, we're looking at the, we're, we've actually got the data for the, for the newest one and I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, but just so you can put it into context, there was over a $7 billion statewide deficit projected in October of 2010 before Governor John Kasich was elected, before the Ohio House of Representatives flipped from Democrat to Republican. So there was a, so when you hear all the stuff about all the cuts in Columbus and the draconian nature of all that, just remember, before any of these draconian cuts ever happened, they were projecting a seven, over $7 billion deficit, cumulatively statewide. Cuyahoga County, thanks to Cleveland predominantly, had over a billion dollars itself. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, and, and, and so that's, and then now they're asking for a 15 bill levy up in Cleveland. So be glad you're not up there in Cleveland. And, and, and the problem with that is a lot of people in Cleveland actually are, the people who actually are going to be paying that, I mean, there's some businesses that'll be paying it, but you've got a lot of lower income folks in Cleveland who are being asked to jack up their tax rate substantially in order to pay for a school district that has been spending out of control for decades. Now, we're gonna have an updated one. We hope to do get this out by after Labor Day. We've done some of the data crunching. I'm working with the folks to put it into charts so we can look at every district, uh, a chart just like this. The number is better now. The deficit is not seven billion. The deficit's only about 2.6 billion, I think, 2.6 or 2.7 uh, billion. Now, there's a lot of reasons why this has happened. There's been tax increases that have happened in some areas. There have been cuts, a lot of layoffs. Uh, and there were, candidly, a few concessions uh, that were done here and there uh, by teachers' unions. I do want to come back to that because when I say there's concessions by teacher unions, it's pretty important to remember that a good chunk of these concessions were in the wake of Senate Bill 5 as the election was gearing up and there was just a little bit of fear, uh, well, there was either fear that it could actually happen, 
Or what I think is pretty telling is it was a great message for them to have that we conceded we don't need Senate Bill 5 because we make concessions, right? <laughs> it made the message of the reformers more difficult. But be that as it may, there have been some substantial cost shedding and there have been tax increases. So there's still a cumulative deficit and you're probably always going to see some level of deficit when you look five years out because of the rotating nature of when people have to do levies and there are some cost increases that are very difficult. I mean, health care has been, I mean, I'll, I'll give the school district some credit, you know, health care is expensive for everybody, the private sector deals with it all the time, they have to deal with that. So there are some issues and even when you transition the costs and try to make uh, uh, employees have to pay more percentage, which is the right thing to do, by the way, but even when you do that, there is a limit to how much of that shifting around is, is, is doable. So I don't want to make it sound that, that, that the school districts are the wor are all, have not tried to do certain things in, in the right way. But simply put, uh, if, you, if you don't want to get on what I call the hamster wheel of local taxes, you're going to have to deal with collective bargaining. And the narrative here is, okay, you've done all these savings, and you're projecting, by the way, these projections assume a pretty absurdly low level of cost increase for the personnel and the uh, uh, cost. Uh, if you don't deal with collective bargaining, those are going to end up being false, uh, not false, I mean, not falsified numbers, but they'll be illusory. They won't be really true. They're going to get jacked up a lot more than people expect. So that $2 billion deficit, which sounds like a great improvement from the one we looked at back in 2010, is probably underselling what the real deficit is really going to be if we don't actually maintain a, a sense of balance with those local, those taxes and with the ability to control the costs. Uh, you know, again, no, no, no surprise here. You probably already heard this. Collective bargaining, big issue. I harp on it. I sound like a broken record. I do it because politicians won't do it right now. They won't talk about it. They're scared to death to talk about it. But collective bargaining, collective bargaining, and collective bargaining in the public sector, big deal. Still there. Got to deal with it. Till we do, we're still going to have problems. Pension pickups becoming a little bit less of a problem because people are starting to learn about it. Um, but it's still there, still a problem, still fits in with the collective bargaining debate to a certain extent, but don't forget your superintendents, don't forget chiefs of police and various other things. When you start doing these public records requests and start asking questions of local governments, you got to ask about the pension pickups. Do they exist? Are they, and, and does everybody know, I guess I'm assuming everybody knows, because you're probably a pretty, you're a pretty a very educated crowd who really knows, but do you know what pension pickups are? Yes. Okay, some of you do, some of you don't, so I'll, I'll mention real fast. It's essentially, the state, each employee is supposed to, for most local jobs, pay 10%, well, state or local, 10% of their salary towards their pension. And then the local employer, the tax, which in this case is governmental entities, so ultimately taxpayers, pay 14% for anybody that's in the, Ohio, uh, the regular PERS system. And actually, they pay for police officers, they pay 19 and a half, I think, percent, and 23. 23, it's over 20, I think it's, it's either 22 and a half or 23 percent for firefighters. 24? Okay, 24. So 24, nearly a full 25 percent <laughs> that the, uh, every local governmental entity, so you, the taxpayers, are paying that amount. But sometimes you pay more because of pension pickups. Sometimes in the collective bargaining agreements at, or contracts with certain superintendents and school districts, you know what you get? An extra perk or part of that 10% you're supposed to pay is actually picked up as well by the local government. So you do have, in some cases, I've seen superintendents that have 100% pickup. That means they're getting 24%. You're probably aware that in some school districts there's also the pickup on the pickup. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, they, they yes, that's, that's horrible. Essentially what they're actually doing is they're actually paying they're, they're actually getting essentially an inflated salary and they're paying again more into the pension system based upon what they're picking up because of that. So it's essentially piggybacking uh, on that. That does happen. Uh, I don't know how often that one happens. That's one of the more egregious ones, but you're right, it does happen more than it should. It's on the, if you go to the, it, what's fascinating is if you go to the STRS, which is State Teacher Retirement System uh, Pension Fund website, they actually have a whole page that talks about the various kinds of pickup things. You should check that out, it's hilarious. But you're right, I'm glad you brought that up. Double yes, dipping. Double dipping, yes. That is another thing that does happen. Somebody retires and then they're rehired, oftentimes in the same board meeting, which means they then, this is a complicated issue. 
because what actually, it's actually a little bit, it's, it's not the right thing to do, and there's a very big moral and ethical issue with it. But interestingly enough, at the local level, it sometimes actually saves money at the local level, but it creates a diffuse cost at the state level. Because what actually happens is, your superintendent, say, retires, you bring them back at the same meeting. They retire at the beginning, and then by the end of the meeting, you rehire them. What happens is they get their pension, but, and you rehire them at a much lower salary. So you're actually paying less on the front end now, because they're basically having their income supplemented by their pension. Uh, but the problem with that is that the pension is paying out to somebody who's still working rather than somebody who's fully retired. So there's a cost to the pension system, obviously, but because that's a much more diffuse cost that's spread out over the entire state, it's not acute to the situation. So it actually saves sometimes the local governmental body money to the local taxpayer by offsetting it to state taxpayers writ large. And actually what you're going to find is, this is one of the problems that all of you have to fight, and we fight it all the time, and this is one of the biggest problems. The acuity, what I call the acuity of benefit versus the diffusion of cost, which essentially means a lot of these issues, the reason Ohio has had all these problems and why local government spending and all these issues get ratcheted up is because the people who get the benefits get one heck of a nice benefit. When you cut that benefit or restrain that benefit, there's a real cost to those individuals, and they mobilize, especially when there's collective bargaining agreements. Mm -hmm. But you, you pay for it, but you pay a little bit. You don't, you don't necessarily pay in any one case a ton. It's the pancaking effect of this over the course of multiple entities and across the state that's the problem. But because it's not any one case, they're going to say, well, you're not going to pay that much more by doing this. And you're gonna you're gonna cut X number of benefits or X number of salary or whatever the cost is, it's not gonna cost you that much. But to all the others make the same argument. That's the problem. Everybody makes that argument. So over time it does cost it, but it's those individual cases. So it becomes very hard because you have to essentially make, and we make this all the time, it's a math problem, guys. It's a very simple it, it really is. It's not affordable, it's not sustainable. We have to deal with it. But making it a math problem versus the emotional gut punch is a problem. Most people are impacted by the emotional arguments. If somebody's going to get fired or somebody's going to lose benefits, there's that thing where a lot of folks just feel that. And then you can talk all you want to about the numbers. You can talk all you want to about how crappy Ohio's economy has been for decades. And the problem is that's an abstract argument. It's true. It's demonstrably true. But it's abstract. The challenge we have is to keep hammering that point home because eventually, these abstract things are going to make it impossible to take care of the things that everybody wants to see taken care of for emotional reasons. The problem is nobody believe, nobody feels it right now. That's the biggest challenge that we, I, I think in many ways that's the biggest challenge being a fiscal conservative has, is making this case emotional because nobody wants to see cuts. Nobody wants to see their neighbor get cut. People just don't like that. There's a certain, con and then, you know, then you get all the, all the other stuff that gets thrown into the mix. What happens about the golden parachute CEOs and the big bad private sector and all that kind of stuff? So you get that, and then the whole argument gets a lot more challenging and gets mired in a lot of mudslinging and all of that. Uh, and then, and then try, try having a reasonable argument with somebody at that point. Uh, but it is, it, it's a big issue, and that's why I think it's important people understand the whole context of why local taxes and the spending at the local level for all the myriad of reasons that there are, some good, some bad, uh, is important so that people understand this fits into the big picture and is creating an environment in this state that is not as attractive for businesses, which means it's not as attractive for people to stay because they're not going to have the kind of job opportunities you can get in these other growing states. Um, I think I see a question. You've been very patient, so thank you, ma'am. I'm just curious. You've got the study on uh, salaries and so forth. Elect officials, we've got local council people that are making $2,000. How can you tell if they are actually getting their health care benefit, if they're in the uh, village health care benefit, or the pension, all these kind of things? Would the salary records disclose that? or because he Yes. Now, let me say this. On our website, we don't probably would not have that because we don't have all the local government, all of it. I mean, there's so many, like I said, so many local governments. But when you ask for a public record, you can get that. And you can ask in the context of the public record exactly what you're looking for. 
I and got copies of ordinances that two ordinances where they passed that they were going to do pickup on everybody, A to Z, so oh, wow. employees, the whole thing. But yet, when they're confronted at a public meeting, the manager says, oh, we don't do that. Well, if you've got the said, it says they passed it, whip it out, saying, well, then what does this mean? I mean, seriously, put them on the spot because that's an important thing to, to, to raise. They, they absolutely, if they're saying that, and you've got the document that shows it. The other thing you can do is when you ask the treasurer or the fiscal officer uh, of, of whatever local body you're, you're, you're talking about, uh, get the payroll and ask specifically for the amount that, that's being put into aside for the insurance. And or the names of the people. And ha yeah, uh -huh. and you can, I mean, that should be, they might give you the runaround, mm -hmm. and they may give it to you in an uncomfortable thing. I mean, everybody ought, honestly ought to be able to give you a darn spreadsheet. <laughs> I mean, they should. They don't always do that, I, I might say, and sometimes they intentionally don't, but they should. Uh, and those that try to do it for the right reasons, you can actually get that. But when you find those situations, you whack them on it. Yes, sir? Uh, uh, quickly, I want, uh, two things from your presentation. One is uh, just to note that some cities have pointed out, you talked about the uh, large number of presidents that came from Ohio, and the cities have pointed out also some of the most mediocre and corrupt. Warren Hart, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Teapot Dome. <laughs> yeah, Teapot Dome. But the other thing, you mentioned in passing North Dakota. It's booming. Yeah. You made reference to natural resources. Uh, that's the oil right now uh, as of late. But yet there's something unique about uh, uh, North Dakota that I would like to see the Buckeye Institute look into because you follow the money. Mm -hmm. And if you went out to North Dakota to follow the money, you may learn something that if adopted in Ohio could put this state at this competitive advantage you're looking for. North Dakota is the only state in the union with a state-owned bank. Since 1919, when the farmers and the others stood up to the big Wall Street banks, stood up to the big railroads, stood up to the big granaries, and was like bankrupting the farmers and other things, they take all the revenues in the state, they put it in a state-owned bank, they give out loans, and they create wealth in the state. Uh, in the last 10 years, for example, $300 million has come back to the state because the interest payments on the loans don't leave the state. Right? Those streams do not go to Wall Street and elsewhere. They circulate in. You can reduce taxes. You can loan out again. You get extremely low rates of interest for students, uh, for business developments. You can work with local and regional banks and allow them to increase the size of their portfolios. And as long as they get the fees for handling these loans, sure. and then the state takes 70% of the loan. So I would suggest you would go there and follow that money. And there's something that that could be of use here to Ohio. That's actually a very interesting point. Actually, I, I was not totally really aware of that. What you hear about in North Dakota right now is uh, the, the, the labor, some of the labor issues, and you hear a lot of, I mean, the, the, the oil and gas thing is, is, is titanic. But that's a fascinating point, and I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, that is something that actually, now that you mentioned it, I'm going to take a look and do some Google searching right away on that to try to take a look and get a little, little, little history and context and things like that. So that's a good point. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, just quickly, for anyone else interested, just go to uh, publicbankinginstitute.org. There's actually a movement in the country to develop public banking across the United States. Driving the big bankers nuts if they get some plates. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and I, I, I'm pretty much done if there's, well, I'll see, I think, see when we have time for another question here? Well, lunch is delayed, so go ahead. <laughs> Fifth, are you familiar, I think it's Fifth, and it's something, uh, Centerville, they asked for a library levy, they got it. Instead, they took the money and applied it to roads in front of the hospital uh, addition that was being on. Never, no vote about that, just now they're coming back with another letter, letter from the request. library. <laughs> so, if I understood what you just said, they did a library request, they used it for roads for some other entity that has nothing to do with libraries, and now they're coming and back to the library a request. Compelling need or whatever, you know, whatever. Uh, wow. <laughs> sounds like some people need to be voted out of office, perhaps, on that one. I mean, that sounds pretty, uh, uh, not knowing more details, I don't know exactly all the ins and outs of it, but that sounds bad, <laughs> to put it mildly, although not entirely shocking. Well, thank you very much. I hope this helped, uh, helped kind of paint the picture. The next, I think, one is on public records, right? Uh, after, and also, that's a really important thing. Get the feel for how to go in there, dig deep, look at it and put the pressure on the local government folks and then keep that pressure so you can keep those taxes low at the local level 
because that's where the battle is shifting, quite frankly. Uh, state's getting better, but we're going to lose those gains if we lose it at the ground level. And